Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Seeing that at 7 o'clock, please rise and join me in the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Burke? Here. Mr. Hand? Here. Mr. Grover? Here. Mrs. Sullivan? Here. Mrs. Bosniak? Here. Mrs. Vanderwater? Here. Um, can I get a motion to approve the meeting minutes of the board meeting held on September 18, 2024? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion made by Mike, seconded by Bob. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Any citizen comments, Lynn? Don't so. Thank you. Um, I'm going to add a one one or a pre one. Um, we have a special guest tonight, Steve McMahon. Our town historian is here to give us a little presentation. So I would like to kick off the meeting with Steve. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. You do have a historian. <laughs> uh, I'm going to put this up here. Um, I began my role of historian in January 23. Uh, since then, I've considered, and first of all, feel free to jump in with any questions or clarifications or anything. Um, I've considered my mission to be discovering and documenting then your town history to make it more accessible to the interest of the public. That's up for negotiation, but that's kind of what I came up with, right? We have a rich history. Some of it's right here. Some of it's that office over there, but most of it's out on the net. Um, when I started out, I set five objectives. Um, you know, and I'm going to read those in a second. Objective two is kind of obsolete because a prior historian, Marilyn Brakey, I think, mm -hmm. um, did an incredible job capturing an inventory of all the materials that are in the office and loading them into a Excel spreadsheet. There are a couple issues with that. She did, she did a very good job. One is um, th there's really no way to make that available online unless you take all the materials and digitize them. So people, when they see an inventory like that, they're going to want to go find the materials. And the only way to do that is come here. And that's a little unwieldy. Um, so there is a possibility that I could start scanning stuff, but a lot of it is just filing cabinets full of newspaper articles, which was great 20, 30 years ago, but in the era of the internet, Ancestry.com, all these other sources that we have, 95% of the research I do is from my home, on the internet, I subscribe to multiple databases, I have my own library of books, it actually has more books than we have in the office, so it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do it that way. Is there an opportunity, though, to get that up and online? I think there's, there probably is. But newspaper clippings and filing cabinets were, were probably past that point. Um, so objective number one was, was within 24 hours of receipt of a local history inquiry, provide an initial response by email or telephone to make contact and clarify the request. Except when I'm traveling out of town. I still work full time, I have my consulting practice, so that gets in the way sometimes. Um, and that's really important, I think, because there are people that want information from us. And in addition to proactively getting information out there, we have to respond to people that have questions about, typically, they want to know the history of their property. That's number one. And number two is their family history. And I can help out in both regards. We'll skip over number two uh, for the reason that I said. Um, like I said, the vast majority of my work is done online with, with digital materials. And in a minute, you'll see what I mean when I take you to our local history webpage. First, don't want to put anybody on the spot, but do you know, do you know we have a, a local history webpage on our website? Raise your hand if you do. Excellent. Darcy. <laughs> Was it just Darcy? <laughs> I love history. I do because so your homework assignment is go look at it. All right, I'll walk you through it today. It's quite an accomplishment. I'm not saying for me, I'm just saying any town, we, you know, every town has to have a story, and any town without one is, is kind of conspicuous by its absence. So I think it's a really important thing to have. Um, number three is develop and execute a plan for creating that online presence on the town's website. I was hired in January 23. By March 23, it was up and running. And I keep adding things to it as I think of things to add. And if you think of things, we can certainly add those as well. Um, number four is collaborate with local other, other local history entities 
Bonnie Kisselstein has forgotten more about the community's history than I will ever know. She's amazing. Uh, Sue McMahon is at the Shaxborough Schoolhouse Museum. I'm in two organizations, the Beecham Historical Club, which with the help of Lynn, we meet here um, and project right against that wall. We usually get 25 to 50 people here for presentations. I welcome you to come. Um, McCary's Legacy, I've been involved with that. And there's something called the Scruple Historical Society uh, over in Phoenix that does the same exact thing and has its own venue. Um, and I'm tied in with Erie Canal Museum, Seward House Museum, Onondaga Historical Association, either through memberships or just contacts. And then lastly, at the close of the quarter, um, I provide this supervisor and have for the last two years with a, just a brief report of here's what I got done this quarter, and if you want to know more, you can come see me. So that's that. Um, you know, as far as objective number one, responding, you know, we don't get a lot, but it isn't as easy as like going to the courthouse and picking up, you know, looking through deeds. First of all, I've done that before. I don't know if anybody else has. It's really, really hard, and that's why there are people that do title insurance searches and things like that. I don't do that. <laughs> Bob um, does. Um, Bob I do does. that. <laughs> a little time consuming? Can be, yes. yes. <laughs> Especially if you're going back to like 1810. Oh, yes. yes. So I'm not doing that, right? So <laughs> there's a limit. But I've got copies of four reports. Um, you can look at them later or just circulate them now. May I approach? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'll just. Each one is different. You can see the kind of detail I get into and wonder why does a man do this uh, for $1,300 a year? I love the game. Because I love it and passionate about it. Um, and so the four I gave you are the Pine Tree Stock Farm, uh, 6581 Kansas Street Road, 10 Grove Street, and 1611 Old State Route 31. How does this happen? Well, we typically get an email or a phone call into Lynn, and somebody says, hey, I want to know more about my property. What can you go find out about it? And using all the resources I'm going to show you on the web page, I just started digging, right? And I dig, and I dig, and I dig, and try to piece together the puzzle of what's the history of this property? When did it start? Who's owned it over time? Is it historical? What's unique about it? I will tell you, in a couple of cases, I've been really pleasantly surprised. This last one I did on 1611 Old State Route 31, what I found out, who's got that copy? Um, it's pretty interesting. I mean, probably one of the first five settlers in the town of Van Buren built that home, and it's still there and it's still standing. And he also built a hotel and a tavern at Iona Corners, or Ionia, Ionia Corners, whatever you want to pronounce it. Yeah. It's been replaced because it burned down, but it was a big structure, and it was right on the state road that went from Onondaga Hill all the way to Oswego, so it was a hopping place. That was the old country tavern. Yes, who said that? Yes, it was an old country tavern. It's been replaced now by something smaller and less conspicuous, but it was, this property is, is very, very important, built by a guy named C.H. Toll. His son, DeWitt C. Toll, was our first magistrate and sheriff in the area, so it's very historic. I won't get into details because you all leave. Um, most of the information I get does come from the sources on the web page that I'll show you, as long as Ancestry. Uh, I've been an Ancestry member for about 20 years. They keep adding information. Very easy to navigate. I'll just tell you, when I started doing this in 1995, you would mail forms away to you know the state archives or different people, and you'd wait eight weeks, and you might get a response. You might get a book. And today, you click, <laughs> and it, it, it can be pretty, pretty fast. Um, so objective number three, I'm going to jump to that because I said number two wasn't really, um, oh there are some family histories that I've done as well where people are trying to find out more about their ancestors. These are typically people from outside of the town, in some cases out of state, and they just, they're digging and they haven't found much, so I try to help out with that as well. Um, this was really, I, I think, my most aspirational goal, and I just said, you know, if we want to be a legitimate uh, source of town history, we probably ought to have stuff available digitally. So I developed an outline and I said, you know, what does it really need to have in it? Things like a general history of the town, early histories of books you can go and find different places, some of them online about the town, early maps, directories of people, gazetteers, which really talked about the size of population, size and square miles, other aspects of how many churches, schools, things like that. Then there's a section on the cemeteries, 
There's an, a site out there called findagrave.com, which is married with ancestry. And if you've been on it, it's unbelievable. Volunteers, I do it myself, go out and photograph gravestones and memorialize these people over time. And it's, we're now up to over millions worldwide of these grave sites. So that's another place that we can go. I did, was able to put together um, a, a quick uh, section on the early schools. So Lysander, which if you're really bored, I wrote a book 15 years ago about the rural schools of Lysander, that's kind of what got me started. Um, was gonna write one about Van Buren and got busy. But you know, before we centralized in 1945 as a community, each of these towns had rural schools, and they had a lot of them. Lysander had 18 of them, okay? And they were all local, tied to hamlets like Horton Town and Little Utica and Lysander proper and Jacksonville, the places we talked about earlier. Same thing in Van Buren, Hard Scrabble, Warners, uh, Van Buren Center, Memphis, all these places had their own school administered by the local population with a local teacher. Now this is where it gets kind of cool, and if my technology works, we're going to be able to see it, and we can. So here's the web page on our website. There's a welcome here, kind of explains what it is. You're not going to be able to see this, but there's the town history. I tried to summarize in a few paragraphs what's different, special, and better about the town of Van Buren and our history. We do have a lot going for us. Um, and then you can go to early histories. They're in um, chronological order from newest to oldest. Some of them are not available online because of copyright restrictions, but I tell you where you can go borrow it. Most of them are local in the Bebo Library. And for the ones that aren't local, um, you just click on the link, and there you are. And so you can go look at this history by Louis Dow Cisco about the town of Van Buren and learn all about our history, who settled here, why they settled here, <coughs> where they live, blah, 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 blah. So that's pretty cool. So we have that going for us. Those are the early histories. There's about six of those. The earliest one is 1849. Uh, the newest ones, I don't know, if, have you heard of Tony Christopher? I mean, he was our most prolific and our first town historian. Um, he did all these photos out in the hallways. He wrote two books on the history of Van Buren. Just incredible. And for over about a 15 year period, wrote a weekly column in The Messenger about local history. I'm sure you remember that. <laughs> Guy was incredible, so those books are available as well. Those are the histories. The maps are pretty cool. Kind of a map guy. Um, there's one from 52, 60, and 1874. You click on that, there you go, and you can zoom in. We are right about where we're at, Ellsworth and Van Buren, somewhere in this neighborhood right there. Okay, I think if I'm not mistaken. So there's maps, and all of them have uh, landowner names on them, along with how much acreage they have. So that's pretty cool as well. Um, you can do that. There's, like I said, three versions, 74, 60, and 1852. All of them work virtually the same way. They go to different places, like this is the Library of Congress. Um, but you can see, if I can get it to work, some of these are county-wide, so you have to kind of zoom in. But there's our town, and again, you can go back a little further and see who owned these properties uh, that way back when. What I typically do is start with the maps and try to find, I know the location of the home, I find the landowner, I go to a place called Fulton History, I look up any newspaper articles about these people, a lot of them are obituaries, so you know who their families were, you know who inherited the property, and in some cases, who they sold it to. Those are the maps. Um, the directories, uh, there's a rural directory of Onondaga County, and you can go in and search that um, by town. Um, I just loaded this this week. There are gazetteers, which are pretty old, and they'll basically tell you, um, you have to search to find Van Buren, so I'm not gonna do that. Once you get there, you have to search for Van Buren, but they'll tell you how many stores, how many blacksmiths, how many schools, how many households. So there's a lot of rich information in there as well. The town cemeteries, um, there was a lady named Leslie Voorhees, who was a great local historian. This woman, in the 1940s, when gas was being rationed, drove around to every cemetery in the area, Lysander and Van Buren, and literally walked grave to grave, documenting who these people were, and created genealogy. She's got a whole book on it. Now, it ends when Leslie got elderly and couldn't do it anymore, but that's a great supplemental book. 
But if you don't have time or the inclination to do that, you just click on this and it will take you to the listing for Iona Cemetery um, at Findery. And you can literally just search for a last name. I know I've got some of my folks buried there. And there's one of them right there. And you can pull it up and there's a memorial for him. In many cases, people start have started loading documents and other information. You can see who's, lo who's related to who down here. You can see people have already lined up who their family are. And, and they may not even be married in the same time as the cemetery. So that's a great resource as well. Every one of our cemeteries in Van Buren has a listing on findagrave.com, um, including those cemeteries Leslie Voorhees didn't include in her book. And so, um, like even, I know we've got responsibility for the Warner Cemetery now. We can go in the Village Cemetery and check, check that out as well. Many of them are in the process of actually being completed. They're getting up to date where all the, all the cemeteries, all the burials have been documented. I don't know. Tell me if I'm running too long. You're I'm fine. To, okay. This is very exciting. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, then the schools. Um, I did do a book, because uh, for this book I interviewed over 50 people that actually attended these rural schools. Unfortunately, 15 years later, a lot of those folks are gone. So that history is gone. But I, did, I was able, some of this is from Tony Christopher, some of it's from other sources. But, you know, you can go into these different schools, click on, there's a photo of Pleasant Valley School. I don't have any information about who these people are, but you can at least get a sense <clears throat> for what it looked like. Um, you know, I'm trying to see if there's one. Oh, um, Shaxboro. Shaxboro is the schoolhouse that is down in the park in the, in the village of Baldwinsville. They relocated it for the bicentennial in 76. So there's a picture of Shaxboro as it looked before it was moved. There it is. Um, and then you can take a look at it as it looks today. And there it is. So, you know, this is a pretty good resource for folks who are interested in schools. What's interesting is, is they're not all at the same location. Some are on a site called New York Heritage. Um, others are other places. Some of them belong to us and they're in the archives and I've scanned them and uploaded them and they belong to us. I didn't mention the cemetery. Um, I found a box in the office with a couple of hundred photos. Most of them were labeled on the back. I guarantee you they've never been made available anywhere digitally. I was able to take 65 or 75 of them over the holidays, lined up the name with a grave, and then loaded it up. And I got, I probably got a dozen thank yous from family members who, we never had a picture of Uncle Joe, but now we've got one. This is great. So. Um, so we've been able to do that as well. So we're still making, taking advantage of the resources that are in the office. It's just a lot of it is just newspaper clippings and stuff that we're really not going to be able to do much with. Um, that's schools. The helpful links too. Um, there are other places that have great, uh, great, great resources as well. You know, one is the local history room at the Baltimore Public Library. I was just there today doing some research. Bonnie has amassed. I got to say, it's probably has the largest inventory of local history materials of anywhere in the state that I've ever heard of or seen. It's amazing. So if you're ever looking for something there, you can, you can check out the local history room. The Erie Canal Museum, they just moved all their archives out to the Erie Canal Park in Port Byron, operated by the New York State Canal Society, so that's moving around a little bit. Fulton History, if you haven't been there, it's amazing. This is another guy. I think I have a strange hobby. This guy's even worse. Um, he's gone and loaded, I don't know, how many hundreds of millions of newspaper pages, uh, you know, I'll just put in here, Van Buren, and you'll get 2,000 hits on Van Buren. You go and look and you can read the articles. Some of them are brand new, some of them are really old. Then you can zoom in and figure out what's going on. Your search terms have to be pretty specific. You can see you get over 2,000 per man urine alone. But if you're looking for people, places, events, and that's typically what we're doing, it's amazing what you can find here. He's got newspapers, I don't know if you know it, but the oldest newspaper in Onondaga <laughs> County was published where? Baldwin's home, in the 1840s. He's got newspapers that old, and they're in great shape, and you can read them, they're legible and everything. So That's old in history. Um, 
What else? Uh, the Lysander Town historian. So Bonnie is a mentor. I've known her for... I, she was a teacher when I was in elementary school. I've known her a long time. She calls us shirt tail relations. We are distantly related. She's done a tremendous amount of work in the community. And whenever I get stuck, I go to Bonnie, you know, and I say, what should I do? Um, uh, the Museum of Shaksboro um, has a great collection of artifacts. Not a lot of researchable materials, but it's there. New York Heritage is an amazing, amazing, amazing place. Um, everybody in the state, all local historians, all local history organizations, any not-for-profits are being encouraged to upload all their images, any images. They've got unlimited space, yearbooks, you name it, up to this site. And so we do have some Tony Christopher photos that are only located on that site. It's amazing. It's got millions of digital images, so you can go there and look as well. Um, New York State Historic Newspapers is very similar to Fulton History. It just um, is more limited to New York State. And for some of the counties outside of central New York, they have more depth and more inventory, so you can go there as well. Um, and then the OHA, the Onondaga Historical Association, um, has been around a long time. They have a lot of artifacts, but they do have research materials as well. So they're a good place to go to, and I do. So these are the resources I use. So if somebody says, hey, I live here, I think it's a historic home, what can you tell me about its history? That's literally what they say. They don't give me any information. And you know, I just go through these sources along with Ancestry.com and just start triangulating and filling in the gaps. And you hopefully can see from some of those histories, they're pretty comprehensive. In the case of the, uh, in the, case of the uh, property at 1611 Old State 31 that was built by C.H. Toll. I narrowed it down to, I know the house was built between 1810 and 1812. That's pretty early. He wants a national historic, or a historic marker or national historic landmark. When you start getting into that realm, some pretty important things have to happen there. It has to be on the Underground Railroad or some abolitionist had to live there, whatever. You can't just say, I got an old house, can we put a sign up? It doesn't really work that way. Um, so what else do I have for you tonight? That's the web page. I don't know how many visits it's getting. I know I use it a lot. <laughs> um, we'll go back to uh, presentation. I have a couple more things to show you. So the other thing I do is I'm very active, as I said, in some of these local history organizations. The Beecham Historical Club in Beeville, the Scruple Historical Club in Phoenix, and we have a calendar of presentations by some pretty capable people. We've really upped our game, I think, in the last two years. We've got the, you know, the director of education from the Seward House Museum, director of education from the Erie Canal Museum, local authors, people like that. Um, and so there's our 23-24 calendar. It's, it's over. Those were the presentations last year. We meet at 6.30 on the first Tuesday of September, November, January, March, and May. November gets moved because of Election Day invariably, and you'll see me up there. My kind of forte is I like to go back and find mysteries, unsolved mysteries and true crimes from the 1800s and early 1900s. So I did one called The Disappearance in Dead Creek um, last year here, and I'm doing it over in, in Phoenix again because you know, people rave about how mysterious and creepy and, I don't know, witchy Whiskey Hollow is. You don't really need to make shit up. I'm just, you make stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing great. <laughs> Lori, do your best. Uh, you don't really have to make stuff up. I mean, there were no witches in Whiskey Hollow. Nobody got their heads chopped off, blah, 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 blah. There were some high school students about 10 years ago who went up there and Hey, I used to drive up there and have a few pops and have a good time, too. Stuff really happened in Dead Creek. This guy got murdered, and we don't know why. It's got ties to gambling and horse racing and out-of-state connections, and it's really fascinating. So I'd rather investigate the stuff that really happened and try to find out what really happened, because that's part of our history, too. People tend to focus, I think, maybe some older historians on who our Civil War veterans were, and all the great things that happened, and a lot of great things did. But every community has its dark side, and I think that's kind of interesting, and a lot of people are interested in true crime. But remarkably, when we do those presentations, we kind of get standing room only, <laughs> instead of 
people are interested in, in the titillating and sensational. Um, so I encourage you to come to uh, some of these presentations if you want. The first one on September 3rd, Derek Pratt came from the Erie Canal Museum, talked about the Waylock Building, and an interesting connection to Baldwinsville because the assistant superintendent of the Barge Canal System, which is the one that goes through Beeville and was opened in 1910, was a Baldwinsville native. So you had a guy from Beeville that was running the canal for the midsection, which is kind of interesting. Um, on the 19th, in time for Thanksgiving, we've got the guy coming from the Seward House Museum talking about Lincoln, Seward, and Thanksgiving. He's great. Both these guys always provide connections to Beeville. You'd be surprised. So um, anyway, you see the other ones up there. I think that's probably all I have. It is. So I didn't know if you had um, any questions about what I do, how I do it, why I do it, or what's available, but I'm going to open it up to the board and guess. Does anyone have any questions? I'm glad to know you do do it. I didn't even know there was a story. <laughs> He's new. <laughs> I keep a little profile. So. No, it, it is very interesting. And I actually think the true crime thing is a good way to uh, bait some of the younger generation. So, yes. I mean, because that's just interesting. Yeah. And um, But then you can expand and kind of educate beyond that, too. So, that's, I like that. And I apologize for not being around and for you not recognizing me and knowing me, but if I can choose between working in that little closet or working at home. That's okay. Most of us are here during the day. Either, yeah. So. So I get a lot more done at home. I probably spend 10 to 12 hours a week on this stuff. Um, you know, 500 hours a year. You can do the math. I think you're getting a bargain. So. <laughs> anyway, I don't do it for the money. I do it because I love it. I love local history. And I'm, I'm just honored uh, that, that you've chosen me. And I know you went through some special um, procedures to make sure that even though I'm out on Cross Lake now, I'm still kind of um, here even though I don't um, fulfill the residency requirement. I appreciate that. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. And um, just for the residents' information, we get quarterly updates from the town historian. Um, so we appreciate that information and thanks for keeping us updated. You're welcome. Thank, thank you for, for coming tonight. Time. Yes, absolutely. I will just say I sit through a lot of meetings, go to a lot of municipalities, and I have never had a historian for a municipality who has done so much. It's impressive. Yeah, it's very impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I like to add to that because it is very hard to find somebody who wants to be a historian. Yeah. And then does well at it. And does well. Yeah. So when Steve came to me and said, hey, I'm out of the area, but I'm interested, it was a, it was a no-brainer to be able to. It kind of goes back to our Greater Baldwinsville thing. You know, yes, yeah. this is Van Buren, but we've all, any of us that grew up here, it's just Baldwinsville. So. Mm -hmm. You can always annex Cross Lake. <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> Property value wise. I know we're out of time. I want to say just one more thing. I think it's important. Uh, Jenny's been pushing for um, us to try to plan for how we're going to celebrate the bicentennial of the Erie Canal. It was completed in 1825. We're very close to the midpoint. It's just across the line in the town of Millis. We know that now. Um, but I am working closely with some of the people I mentioned up there to try to collaborate and figure out what we can do to celebrate it. Unfortunately, New York State has kind of left all the towns to their own devices. And so um, Onondaga County is working with each town, and we're trying to put something together that will do the canal justice. We've got one hamlet that actually was on the canal. That's Memphis. Warner's is actually not. Newport is over the line in the town of Camillus. Warner's wasn't really a canal town, but Memphis was. So I'm working on that, and I will have more information for you in the near future. Excellent. Thank you very much. It would be wonderful to have you come and just give a little bit of history anytime that you feel something is important that you want to bring to the board and at a board meeting. Come on out. I mean, this, this is her. great. If you find out more information about the Whiskey Hollow, well, come Phoenix on October 15th. You can find out all about it. Plug. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, back to our agenda. Um, can I get a motion to approve the vouchers? Um, this uh, voucher run is $29,096.96. Okay. Motion made by Darcy, seconded by Jenny. Any comments or questions? 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, we have no budget transfers tonight, so we'll skip that. Um, can I get an authorization for the supervisor to sign a one-year agreement with Advanced Business System for Computer and Networking Services? Um, thank you, Nadine. You did a great job reviewing that contract, and I appreciate the comments that you um, requested for editing that um, agreement. So you were amazing with that work. So thank you for doing that. I like motion. that motion. Second. A uh, motion made by Mike, seconded by Darcy. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Um, approved payment in the amount of $14,453.07 to Advance Business System for a one-time hardware onboarding costs. So this will cover all of their um, equipment that they will bring that we will own and it will cover um, the onboarding for hooking up the computers and um, networking all of the um, files that we currently have. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion made by Jen Jenny, seconded by Mike. Any comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, and I have a penciled in number five. Um, tax cap. Um, we're going to introduce the local law for the tax cap um, levy. Um, Nadine, would you like to speak to that? Yes. Uh, municipalities are required to keep any increases to their budget to less than 2%. It's actually not always even a full 2%. It depends on the formula that is um, applied. But the municipalities have the ability to override that 2% by passage of a local law. Most municipalities do this um, as a precaution, not knowing how their budget is going to work out. So this does not necessarily mean that it's going to be over 2% increase, but it gives the board the ability to do so if they need to. So it requires local My control. understanding is if we were to pierce it without it, there's a huge penalty from the state. Correct. To, yeah. Okay. Correct. You will get in trouble with the state controller. <laughs> Thank you. So the goal is to introduce it tonight, and then we need two um, meetings. But just next meeting, there'll be a public hearing, and you can enact it on the 15th, right? 16th. 16th, yes. Yeah. Um, so do I need to schedule a public hearing? That's in this. You have a resolution. Oh, it's in here already. The okay. resolution acknowledges that it, it introduces the local law. It schedules this for a public hearing on the 16th of October, and it also acknowledges that this is a um, unlisted action for purposes of seeker and renders a negative declaration. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Yes. And um, thanks to our town clerk because she kind of scrambled with throwing this together before a board meeting because I oh, overlooked it. So thank you, everybody. Um, can I have a motion to introduce the tax cap law? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any comments? Um, just to reiterate, as Darcy said, um, if we were to pierce it, there would be a penalty. We've done this every year. This is just a precaution. The draft budget is currently online, and we don't feel like we're going to come anywhere near that, but it's just a matter of housekeeping, I would say. And we never have. So. Great. All um, right. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Roll call. No. Okay. Um, motion passes. Thank you very much. And I have uh, penciled in six. Um, can I get a motion to approve payment in the amount of $10,985 for the purchase of the Canon Image ProGraph um, printer that the engineering office and the codes office will share? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Motion made by Darcy, seconded by Bob. Any comments? Jason, would you like to just speak to that real quickly? Sure, it's a large format scanner, so we'll be able to uh, print uh, 24 by 36 drawings, which we get, uh, uh, and for designs that I do, when we go out to bid. Uh, the added benefit of it is it has a scanner, so we can take our old documents, archive them, <laughs> um, and eventually tie them to our GPS for uh, our town map, uh, which is hosted by the Regional Planning Board. So if you want to click on a catch base, and the as drawings will pop up that we scanned in, and so 
was this a great tool towards getting towards that, uh, that goal. Great. And as we continue through uh, our budget process, um, one of the things that we really have goals of doing is updating our technology here in, in the town hall um, because that's the way life is moving, technology everywhere. Um, and I do also want to comment that um, this will also serve as a useful, useful equipment for the planning board as well. Um, any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Okay, um, Councilor Committee reports and comments. I will start with Bob. All right. Um, on Monday we had a highway meeting. Went through a few things that uh, the highway department did over the summer. Uh, there was uh, four or five projects that they did for uh, road work, including out at Harbor Heights, uh, Village Green, the Connors uh, Road project they also did. Um, we're looking for possibly January, February for our uh, plow truck, uh, hopefully, keep our fingers crossed that that comes in. Uh, that's one that we had uh, purchased a while ago and it's taken quite a while to get through. Um, drainage districts, we had quite a few of them that they did out on Baker, Mays Road, uh, looks like the Marion Meadows project, uh, they're hoping to start dredging some of that uh, here pretty soon, weather pending. Uh, what else did we have? Uh, other than that, Oh, the one thing, the, the signs, the digital uh, signs that we have placed around the town seems to be working. Uh, I think there's been less calls. Uh, we still have had a couple calls, so uh, I know Jason and Doug were going to look at some uh, other areas where they could place the signage, and hopefully uh, the drivers will pay attention and slow down. Other than that, I think we're all set. Great. Thank you. Darcy. I don't have anything to type. Um, Jenny, I know you have a lot. I don't. What? <laughs> no, I'm gonna just breeze through this quick. So we had last Wednesday, we had a Van Buren, uh, well, not Van Buren, but Parks and Rec and Building and Grounds meeting. It was very productive. Um, Chris and Heidi are amazing. Um, they are very efficient. They do well uh, under pressure. They're just amazing, and I'm so glad that we have them. Um, they're such a great asset to us. Yeah. So Chris is getting ready. He's he's getting ready to pressure wash the basketball court because we're going to be repainting and resealing the um, basketball court. The baseball field project is about 50% complete. Is that correct, Jason? The drainage portion. Yeah, the drainage. So the drainage that we're working on. Um, the summer program was amazing. Uh, Heidi's got some great ideas for for the next year, and um, she's looking at the fees um, schedule for next year that we'll discuss during the 2025 budget that's coming up um, during our meetings in the next couple of weeks. There's also some uh, capital improvement projects that we talked about, which is some that we can fit in for 2024 with some of the grants that we still have, as well as 2025 and our five-year projected plan. Uh, that's it for parks and buildings and grounds. And then tomorrow at 7.45, I have a Kent Woods board meeting. A.M. A.M. Did I say PM? No. Oh, AM. Sorry. Yes. I yeah, probably wish it. it was at PM, but it's at AM. Yes. That's I'd rather have it at AM. I do too. Jen, thank you so much for that. Uh, Mr. Burke, do you have anything to make? I do not. Thank you. Um, supervisor comments, I just have uh, a couple things. Um, as we transition out of CivGov in the codes office, um, we started off with 231 files in there of um, open permits and such. And as we're transitioning out, um, our codes clerk has been moving that data onto um, her computer. So at started at 231, she's down to a, under 100. So she's been doing a fabulous job. Um, exporting that document and documentation and maps and everything out of there so we won't lose it when we transition over to Williamson. So a big shout out to Caitlin Fowler for doing a great job. Um, 
I think we've covered everything else for tonight's agenda. I would like to uh, call for an executive session after we do comments to discuss a personnel issue. Um, there will not be any action taken, um, so no one needs to hang around. <laughs> um, highway superintendent. Um, just like to get out ahead of towards the end of this month, people often start calling in for delineators for marking roads for the dreaded white stuff. Um, as a reminder, we typically, unless we're going to get some freakish storm, we do not like to put them out before Halloween just so that it's safer for the kids to go walking around and get their heads on and so on and so forth. So you're welcome to call in and place your name on the list, but you would like them, but we will not put them in up till after Halloween. Uh, secondly, just thoughts and prayers going out to everybody that was affected by the storms. Yes. yes absolutely. Thank you, Doug. Um, Jason, any comments? Unless there's any questions for me now. Anyone have any questions? Nadine. I have nothing. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, motion to go into executive session to discuss a personnel problem or issue. Uh, I'll second. Okay. Motion made by Darcy, seconded by Jenny to go in um, executive session. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I really appreciate it.